Today is a special episode of Dead Rabbit Radio. We're going to take a look at one story. And that is the story of the Book of Giants. A book that was considered too weird to be included in the Bible. In Genesis, there is a brief section that mentions the flood that destroyed all of the evil men in the world. But there was an entire book telling the backstory of what happened, involving giants, rogue angels, and a battle so epic, the scale has never been matched at any other point in history. We'll explore that and more today on Dead Rabbit Radio. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of Dead Rabbit Radio. I'm your host Jason Carpenter. I'm having a great day. I hope you guys are having a great day too. I got some Patreons. I set up my Patreon account yesterday and I got some. I want to say thank you to Elky, Dave H, Dave Carr, Scott Stewart, and Chris Kilborn for supporting the show. That's really, really awesome. And I want to say, just so you guys don't think I'm wasting your money, I bought this book. Let me read you the description of it. What is the agenda and purpose of all of this alien activity? Why do they hate humanity and work in the darkness? Are we prepared to face them? The war started over 6,000 years ago. I'm assuming this was written by a hardcore creationist. The story started over 6,000 years ago. Now, it is more evident with the increasing violence and deaths. What forces are behind it? You can't escape if you are human. They come to eat your flesh and drink your blood. There is only one weapon that will destroy them. Discover it before it's too late. That is the description for this book. I have found no reviews on it whatsoever. It came out two years ago. It's self-published. It's called Gay Aliens, The Great Deception. And oddly enough, there's copies of the book that are listed as Gay Aliens, The Great Reception. So I don't know if he originally had a typo, but I ordered that book. Thank you, Patreons, for allowing me to buy this $11 book. So I will read Gay Aliens. I hope, I, I'm assuming it's him saying that aliens are turning people gay. I'm going to assume that's just based on the title. But that, I don't know. Based on that title and that description, it could literally be anything. But yeah, so Gay Aliens, The Great Deception. I will let you guys know when I get it, if it's any good. Spoiler alert, it won't be, but I at least assume it will be hilarious. And it's in paperback. There wasn't even a Kindle, so I get to have a book sitting on my bookshelf with that title. Okay, so let's go ahead and move on to our first story. Now, our first story does require a bit of an introduction. And I'm going to keep this as brief as possible, because it's basically, it's a history lesson. I recorded one version of it. It was 10 minutes long. It was totally boring. Okay. Back in Bible times, there was a guy named Enoch, and he went on these adventures, and he wrote about them in this book called The Book of Enoch. Now, this is pre-flood when Enoch was kicking about back there, right? And he has this, his book is weird. I might do an episode on just his book. He goes into space, he's hanging out with angels, he's doing all these wacky adventures, right? He's a very, very well-respected man in the region, and he's in, like, the Jewish lineage, so he's a real person. He is mentioned several times throughout the Old and the New Testament. He was related to Noah, I believe, as well. But real guy shows up. But anyways, he says he went on all these adventures. And he also is a main character in the book we're going to look at, the Book of Giants, which takes place pre-flood as well. Now, back in the, like, I think it was like 400 AD, when they were kind of putting the Bible together. Jesus is gone. They're putting the Bible together. When they're having this huge voting council, they get to the Book of Enoch and the Book of Giants, and they're like, no, no, you cannot put these books in the Bible. We have talking snakes, we have buildings being blown up by trumpet horns, but this is just ridiculous. So they took it out, and it pretty much disappeared, because people stopped studying it, people stopped talking about it. And back then, you didn't have the internet archive. It was just gone. They did end up, centuries later, there was half of it, a version of half of it, found in China. It was written in Aramaic, but it was found in China. And they're like, oh, look, it has Enoch in it. This is related to the book of the Bible. This is probably, we've heard references to the book of Giants. This is probably it. In the 1940s, two dudes were knocking about in the Middle East. They walked into a cave by the Dead Sea and found a bunch of books of the Bible that were written between like 300 BC and 200 AD preserved in jars and in those jars you had like real books of the bible or canonical books of the bible like you had like genesis and acts whatever you had all the goodies you had all the goodies but you also had the book of giants the first half it starts to decay halfway through 
So people have looked at it and they go, this is really, really weird. Probably shouldn't have been in the Bible. It just is just too weird. But I said Enoch is mentioned throughout the Bible. Elements of this story I'm about to tell you are mentioned throughout the Bible. And in Genesis, the book of Genesis, it says, hey, listen, there was a time when some angels came down and started having sex with humans. And that, I love this quote. So let me read you this real quick. When human beings began to increase in number on the earth and daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw that the daughters of humans were beautiful and they married any of them that they chose. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days and also afterward when the sons of God went to the daughters of humans and had children by them. They were the heroes of old, men of renown. So, that's just a little part of Genesis. And then it goes on to say, God said, this is not what I wanted. This isn't working. Humans are too wicked now. I'm going to cause a flood. And then he goes, yo, Noah. And Noah looks up in the sky and, and God is mimicking building a boat. Noah's like, oh yeah, I should do that. He's, he's playing Fortnite all day long. God's like, come on, man, build that boat. He's like, yeah, I'll do it tomorrow. The ultimate procrastinator. So that's it. But the book of Giants explains... There's eight verses in Genesis that tell that story. The book of Giants explains step by step what happened. Way more than a flood. Way, way more than a flood. So let's hop on board the carpenter copter. Strap in, because this one's going to be nuts. We are going back in time to the Middle East. Coming over. Nice little town. Everything's made of clay, except the people and the animals. All the buildings are made of clay. Candles are flying over. It's nighttime, right? Now, the reason why we're here is this is the story of the Book of Giants. God says, actually, you know what? Let's go to heaven. Let's go and sit in this meeting. We're going all over the place for this one. We're floating on a cloud. We're floating on a cloud. We're in a giant meeting. God's sitting there smoking a giant cigar. He's seated at a table with 200 angels. And he's like, listen, guys, Project Earth is going great. But I think we need to do a little bit of more on the blue marble. Pulls down a pie chart. He's like, listen, this is how many people are on the planet. And this is how many of them are morally good. I need you, my angels, my watchers, as the humans know you, to go down there and show them what needs to be done. Takes a couple puffs of cigar. And now the leader of this group of watchers is Shemi Haza. Now I should say right now that every angel sitting in this boardroom, this is long after... Lucifer tried overthrowing God, and there was a giant war in heaven. It was the ultimate act of rebellion, and God took Lucifer and one-third of the angels and cast them out of heaven. This is way after this. There was a massive war in this alternate dimension before time and space had actually even crystallized into a real thing. Everyone sitting in this meeting fought in that war, okay? There's not a single person of this 200-man team that does not know what happens if you don't follow the rules. Some of them may even be like, oh man, you know, I really like Lucifer. He's a really cool guy. Too bad he went nuts. And they're like, yeah, you know, just forget it. But they all remember that, okay? Just remember that as a thing that's going to happen throughout the story. So Shemi Haza and his homeboys are like, we will go to Earth and do what you say. And God goes, and before they're all leaving out the door, he stops them. Whatever you do, do not bang them. And they're like, why would you even, why would you even suggest that? He is omnipotent. He does kind of know what's going to happen next. But Shemmy House is like, of course not, dude. Humans are gross. So then, 200 angels fly down to earth. And they do what God says. They start teaching people how to be like good people. They're picking up old ladies and dusting them off. And then they're like repairing the clay houses. And they're like, you know, you probably could use some wood in this house. And they're like, oh, yeah, maybe. Giving them advice and stuff like that. And we're watching this whole thing. We're just eating apples. We're having a good time watching these angels do what angels do. But then, as the angels are helping like build a barn or whatever, this woman walks out of her house. And Shemmy House is like, oh, God, his eyes get super big. They're all bouncing out tongue. <laughs> it falls instantly in love with human females. And we, at this point, we stop eating our apples because we know something bad's going to happen. And it spreads. Every, the angels are just amazed at how beautiful human females are. And to be fair, human females are quite beautiful. So they start banging the women. Now, that is bad enough. Because you're basically creating a half-human, half-angel baby. 
But it doesn't stop there. When God is talking about destroying the world, I think anyone who's familiar with the story of Noah, but if you aren't, when he's talking about destroying the world, it's not just that there's a bunch of half-human, half-angels. He does, in the Bible, it uses the term, they were the hero, the mighty heroes, the heroes of renown, they're mighty warriors. It wasn't just that. The, the, when you look at the Book of Giants, there's a phrase that's used over and over again. The women prostituted themselves. I'm like, what? We didn't see none of that. We saw a woman walk out of a house a guy turned into a cartoon fox for a minute, and then they started banging. But what was going on is the women were basically saying, I will have sex with you, but I want power. I want knowledge. I want to know what you know. And what we see in the Book of Giants is there are phrases saying that they were taught the secrets of the universe. You have these celestial beings that existed before the universe even had shape. And you, they're, going, they're on a first date. And the girl goes, so what are you doing? He's like, oh, I'm a watcher. You know, I help build barns and stuff like that. And she goes, do you know how to stop time? And he would. He may not have the necessary power to be able to do that. But he would go, well, yeah, actually, I do know how it's done. He'd start explaining how black holes work and all sorts of stuff. They taught them the dark arts. They taught them basically how to be a witch. And in return, the women had their babies. So that is the beginning of the wickedness. You have angels no longer there teaching people, you know, give a penny, take a penny. They're teaching them, this is how you raise the dead to impress these women. And the women, in turn, were banging them. And the babies were described as giants. Now, sometimes they were literal giants. Sometimes they were just massive people. One of them supposedly was 450 feet tall. Which, out of all the details of the story, even the ones I want to tell later, I think that's the most unbelievable thing. Some of them... The word giant just in that context meant immensely strong, mighty. So these children were heroes. Gilgamesh, the hero from the Mesopotamian mythology, is listed as a Nephilim in the Book of Giants. So he's this mighty, mighty hero. These people like Hercules, which is the same story, a human and a god having a baby, causes people to be superhuman. We're not talking Superman level, but we're talking Captain America level, Hulk level type heroes. We are now reading the newspaper, because a couple of generations are passing at this time. We luckily don't age, otherwise we'd be dust by this. We're reading the Daily Clay, it's the only newspaper in town. And it's just story after story about these great heroes who are going out and slaying enemies and bashing lions open, picking mountains up and throwing them around. Just insane stuff. Your newspaper is a comic book. There's no pictures back then, they didn't know how to draw. So it's just words, like regular book. But anyways, the point is, is that all of these great adventures are going on, but... Power corrupts. And these watchers and their witch wives and their mighty, mighty kids decide, why are we protecting humans? We are the dominant species on this planet. They cannot fight against us. Because there would be wars. You'd have one of these Nephilim, which was the half-human, half-angel. You'd have one of these Nephilim just massacre a thousand people in a battle. You could not stop these guys. And they go, why are we fighting? Why are we even fighting for these guys? We should just be ruling them. So then, this is when we pack up and leave town. Most people do. And this is happening all over the region. The Watchers begin to enslave humans. Now, it, 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 again, all of this stuff is really like cliche sci fi fantasy stuff. But for thousands of years, people, this was a book of the Bible. People believed this existed. It wasn't until a couple people voted it out that it stopped being part of the canon. Anyways, let's step back into this. We're running out of town. We're getting the carpenter copter flying away. And if you're human, you're enslaved. If you're lucky, most likely they just bashed their head in. They began to take over large parts of the region. And then power corrupts. They begin to go to war with each other. So now you have different angels and their superhuman children fighting other angels and superhuman children for control of a ravine or farmland or whatever. And normal humans can no longer live in this area. It was just too chaotic. Enter Enoch. So Enoch is, Enoch is a totally weird dude. He has a few, he's almost a superhuman in his own aspect, but he's basically like God's messenger, God's homeboy on the planet Earth. Enoch is watching all of this, right? And it gets to the point where the Watchers basically go, you know what? We're just going to start eating people. Like, we're tired of keeping slaves and we're tired of just killing them. We're going to start eating people. So the Watchers begin to eat people. So now we're not even slaves. We're just dumb animals ready to be devoured. 
at that point, you know, at that point, Enoch calls up God and says, hey, you need, you need to do something about this, right? You need to do something about this. You kind of caused this in the first place. God, God, again, first he's a business, first he's really proactive working a business meeting. It's maybe been 150, 200 years since this all started. In that period of time, God has become a total deadbeat dad. He wants nothing to do with what's going on on earth. Enoch goes, listen, you have an army, you have an immeasurable army. You have 200 angels and thousands of wives and who knows, tens of thousands of superhuman children running around the area. You got to do something about this. And God, God tells Enoch, no, you, you, you go do something. I'm just going to sit here on my big fluffy couch. I'm retired. And Enoch goes, so let's walk, let's go on a walk with Enoch. We're going to walk with Enoch. And we're going to enter the camp of the giants with the Shemihaza. And we're standing now. We're flanked by a bunch of, a bunch of angels and a bunch of hot witches. There's few human kids. And Enoch goes, listen, you guys need to stop. You guys need to stop. We're like, that's all you're going to say? And Enoch kind of puts his hand up. He's like, oh, give me a second. Give me a second. You need to stop. Because if you don't stop now, God's going to destroy all of you. Shemmy Haza is like, oh, God can't destroy. Actually, no. At that point, in reality, Shemmy Haza was like, uh uh-oh. Because again, they have seen what happens to angels when they go rogue. But Shemihaza dismisses Enoch, gets him out of there. We all get thrown out on our butts. And he doubles down. They begin holding secret occult meetings on the top of this mountain in the region. They would figure out, they are basically now uniting themselves. So the war between the Watchers and their children was going to have to come to an end. They would have to provide a united front because they know what's going to happen. There's one version of the story. This was one that, because I had to read a bunch of articles on this, I wasn't able to verify this in other versions, but there's one article I read that when they were on that mountain, they were in contact with Azazel, which was another name for Satan, for Lucifer. And they were basically saying, well, if God's going to destroy us, if we don't stop and we don't want to stop, maybe Satan will help us out with that sweet, sweet satanic power. So they've totally just, God said, stop doing it. And they totally went in the opposite direction. So at this point, God finally gets up off the couch and just makes them have bad nightmares. Like, <laughs> again, he can totally end it at any point. He gives them bad nightmares. So the sons of Shemihaza, one night they woke up, and they had this horrible dream. So they hold another meeting because of this kid's dream. And he says, this is what I dreamt. He goes, I dreamt I was walking through a garden, and there was 200 trees in the garden. And then an emperor came down like a burning fireball. And the other Watchers, this dream, that sounds kind of like just a basic surreal Lynchian type dream, but it really concerned the Watchers that he had this dream. So they said, listen, there's one person that you can talk to. He's the smartest person on the planet. Go talk to him and ask him what the dream means. His name's Enoch. So one of these mighty warriors comes to Enoch, Enoch's little shack. We're just hanging out there. Guy walks in and he goes, hey, you might know me from killing all those bears the other day. But Enoch, I have to ask you about this dream. So he describes the dream to Enoch, and Enoch's just sitting there drinking his tea. Enoch is around 300 years old at this point. I should have mentioned that earlier. Enoch is a very, very old and wise man. He's drinking his tea, and he goes, I know exactly what that dream means. The 200 trees represent women, not the watchers themselves. They represent the women, the wives. And those trees were watered by corrupt gardeners, who are the watchers. And the fruit those trees were bearing was poisonous fruit, and that's you, the Nephilim. The emperor coming down on the throne is your destruction. You are going to be destroyed first by fire and then by flood. You will be wiped off this planet. The warrior goes back, tells Shemihaza. Shemihaza comes to Enoch and goes, is there any way we can stop this? And Enoch goes, nope. You've interfered with the normal plan. You had all these babies... You can't have this race on this planet. You just can't. You're not allowed to. Shemmy House is like, if we pray, and Enoch's like, nope, it doesn't matter. You should pray for forgiveness. Is You're going to die, but there is nothing you can do to stop your death at this point. And Shemmy House is like, that's not funny. I thought you were gonna, I thought you were gonna insert a joke there. And Enoch's like, no, no, no jokes during that part. I can dab on you before I leave. Will that make you feel better? Shemmy House is like, kinda. So Enoch dabs on him. 
and he leaves. Shimmy Hazzy goes, that was kind of cringy, but it did make him feel a little bit better because now he knows that not only is he doomed, but his children are doomed. But like everyone who has their back against the wall, you figure, May- maybe I can make one last-ditch effort. So he gets all of the other Watchers together, all of their witch wives, all of their children, so they have this massive army, and they're hanging out by this mountain where they worshipped Azazel. And so every ba- everyone on this battlefield under Shemihaza's control has superpowers. They would be the equivalent of if the X-Men and the Justice League and the villains, uh, the Legion of Doom, whatever, all of them were in one plateau. So, of course, nobody's going to fight these guys except for God, right? So, but God, again, is the deadbeat dad of this story. He doesn't do anything, directly, at least. So he calls up his buddy, Raphael. He gets Raphael up there, and Raphael's an archangel, and he's like... I need you to clean up a mess. <laughs> I need you to clean up a mess for me. Raphael's like, another one? And God's like, yes, yes. But this one will be particularly exciting if you ever wanted to fight a bunch of superhumans. Today's the day. Raphael's like, ah, oh, it sounds kind of cool, doesn't it? God's like, I know, it actually is kind of cool. It sucks that I gotta wipe all these people out, but they're just, they've polluted the gene pool on Earth. So Raphael is like, I gotta assemble a team. I gotta put my crew together, God. And God's like, go ahead and do that. So Raphael goes into the the ranks of heaven and he goes, I want you and you and you. That's it. And everyone's like, that's all you're taking? We, they, they know what's going on down there. Raph's like, I think we got this, right? So he brings down uh, Michael, Gabriel, and Uriel, which are all archangels. So you have four archangels versus 200 angels, all these <laughs> witches, and a bunch of giants. Again, all of these angels have fought during the war in heaven. And these particular four that are coming down were the generals. They were basically, if you put Conor McGregor, General Patton, and Superman in a blender, these guys would be Superman-level heroes. You put them in a blender, the blender would break, but out of the ruins of the blender would come Raphael. So, they come flying down, into this giant field where all these people are assembled come down i guess they wouldn't go it sounds like they're like just coming through a wind tunnel big old angel wings so they swoop down land on the battlefield and they're like it's time to go shemihaza shemihaza's like no now we can get into the dramatic like the war drums are coming and shemihaza's sweating all of the angels are sweating at this point. All the watchers are sweating. The kids, the like the superheroes and their wives don't real they're just like, look at there's four of them versus all of us. We're going to win. But the watchers know these guys. They're like, uh-oh. War drums. Giants roaring in the distance. 450 foot tall giant. Now we're hiding behind a rock. We're watching this battle. We're hiding behind this rock. And, and I should say now, Enoch is gone. And he's not anywhere near this battlefield. And not only is he not near this battlefield, he stole the carpenter copter. So we are stuck on the ground. We're like hiding behind a rock. We are basically two hobbits on this massive battlefield. Raphael pulls out a flaming sword, making sure he doesn't catch his wings on fire. Takes off. <laughs> Anyways, dramatic music. Duh, 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 duh. And you have these four angels begin to basically carve their way through this sea of superhumans. Now, and carve would be a good way to put it because they're just decimating these guys. But four of anything versus these numbers, it's not a cakewalk. These angels are cutting down these dudes, fighting these other angels. Chopping off the heads of a couple of witches. Shooting off witty one-liners. Ah! All is fair in love and gore. <laughs> Split dude's guts open. Uh, I can't think of a, I can't think of a pun for a giant. But anyways, uh, he doesn't say anything. just stabs the giant in the stomach. The giant falls on a bunch of people. Anyways, they're chopping all these people up. But they are outnumbered. They are outnumbered. And over the course of the battle, they're not doing too well. They're really not doing too well. Enoch is gone, and we're stuck there. And then that is when the tide of battle turns. Enoch wasn't... Enoch 
God is constantly just not paying attention to anything that's going on. Enoch, however, goes, you know what? I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go take care of some stuff, dude. I'm gonna go take care of some stuff. The angels are holding their own, but they're slow, the wheel of the battle is slowly turning against them. That is when, throughout the valley, you hear a... And at that point, this is in the Book of Giants, I thought this was an incredible detail. At that point, 400,000 humans from across the globe have assembled on this battlefield. An army of 400,000 men has been drafted up. The legends went out that today is the day we destroy the giants. Today is the day we take back Earth. And that cry went out. People would just pick up their spear, leave their village, grab their shield and their sword, get their son to tend the farm as all the adult men left the city. And they just came from all over to that field. And they didn't just come with swords and shields. The Book of Giants is very specific on the weaponry they brought. This is part of the fragment from the Book of Giants. 400,000 righteous came with fire, napatha, and brimstone. The biggest weapon they had against these giants was fire. You have all of them in one location, and they just begin raining hell down on these mutants. Torched the entire area. And as they're burning, as these giants are burning, as these witches are being torched, You had wave after wave of humans, totally normal people, running into battle, attacking these superhumans. Taking back, for the first time, the first time humans were able to fight these guys. It took four archangels on their side. It took surprise attack. It took thousands and thousands of gallons of napalm and brimstone, big old rocks, big guys are putting on oven mitts, throwing big, heavy rocks of brimstone at him. People are looking at him. He's like, are you sure you're not a giant? He's like, no, I'm not a giant. Drinks a giant bucket of ale. Totally normal. They just burnt these monsters to the ground. And Samihaza is watching this whole thing, and he knows it's over. He knows that there is the archangels are getting their second wind. 400,000 troops are surrounding them, far outstripping his army, and there's just no way they're going to make this. So he leaves. He takes off. The day is won. (sighs) Sharon, after that, Enoch leaves. Now, one of the most interesting things about Enoch, again, one of the passages that's mentioned in the canonical Bible about him, is that Enoch doesn't die. Scholars, the the way the Bible verse is set up is that he walked with God and then he was no more. And that has been believed to be by scholars that he didn't die. He was taken away. He's considered to be the only man in history who never died. He's He's in heaven and he's still alive. So that's how much of a pimp this dude was. That's how... Like, God, even God's like, you know what? I made you do some ridiculous stuff. You didn't get to fly around in space, but... Yeah, you don't gotta die, man. I'm gonna give you a bus pass to heaven. I'm going to... I guess it's more of like a limo ride. It's not even a bus pass. You don't even have to die. Come hang out with me. Just come chill with me. And Enoch's like, yeah, yeah, that's cool. And after Enoch leaves, Raphael visits Samihaza one last time. (sighs) Lands in front of his hut. There's still a few giants left. Still a few wives, still a few watchers, but the majority of them were wiped out in this battle. But they were still there, and they were still interbreeding. And so Raphael lands, and Samihaz is sitting there, probably all burned up, probably sitting there all bandaged up in bed. And Raphael says, so Enoch's gone. Enoch's gone now. Samihaz is like, is he dead? Raphael's like, no. But he's in heaven. He's not here anymore. Samihaz is like, that's weird. That's, no, that's not expected. Raphael's like, yeah, in mysterious ways, you know all that stuff. But I'm telling you this because now it's time for the second part of God's plan. There is a flood coming, and it will destroy you. This is just a message from one angel to another. Because we fought together. I've known you for a billion years, Samiaza. It's time to repent. You can't avoid this. 
You've been putting it off all this time. You gotta repent. And Raphael flies away. And as he's flying away, little raindrops start falling. Sami Haza looks outside of his hut and just watches the rain fall. The Great Flood has started. So, the story's fascinating on several different... As a narrative, the story, I think, is really, really fascinating. Just as a story. But what I... Th- I you can pick it apart. I th- so, I think probably the most interesting takeaway from this story is that people go, well, if the people in biblical times were super wicked, and then God destroyed the world, aren't people today probably even more wicked than they were back then? Or have been at periods of time more wicked than they were back then? But that's not the re- according to the Book of Giants, that's not the reason why the flood happened. It was the fact that they were being wicked, but you also had uh, an entire subspecies on Earth that was destroying his people. Now, I know a lot of people are going to go, wait a second, so 400,000 righteous men showed up at that battlefield and fought off the giants, but then God killed them all with a flood. Here's an, and I don't want to get too much into the weeds on this thing, but the Great Flood. The, the, the Bible is, a, is not a history book. It is the religious history of the Jewish people. When they had the Great Flood, it flooded the region. The word, the, you know, it keeps saying that the, world is, the entire world is flooded. It kills all the humans and stuff like that. That's not what happened. If you look at it in a spiritual, a spiritually historical text, the flood f- killed everyone in the region. Because even the most ardent creationist, I can't imagine, could argue, well, they can be ridiculous, but there is absolutely no way. I believe there was a great flood. I believe that Noah built the ark and all that stuff. I do not believe for one second that Noah got off the ark with his family, and then a thousand years later, you had a bunch of Chinese people, and they're all descended from Noah. That is completely ridiculous. There is no logic. I believe that a giant flood happened, and a, a select family got on a boat, and the entire region there was wiped out. But outside of that region, you'd have people being like, whew, good thing I was living on this cliff. I don't think Noah and his family were the last people left. I think elements of the Noah story are a parable. I don't think you put two of each animal on the boat. Again, that just doesn't make any sense. But the idea of someone having a portent of a natural disaster, avoiding said natural disaster, and then reclaiming the land where everyone else was destroyed, I think historically that could have happened. I guess in a world where there's giants, you could fit two animal, two of each animal on a boat. But anyways, I'm, I'm getting too much. So those 400,000 people who came to fight the giants, they weren't all then wiped out by the flood. They went back to their own regions and continued to prosper. When you hear that story, it's funny because, again, half of it was a remnants in China. And then they found another chunk of it in the, they, and then they found the beginning half in the Dead Sea Scrolls. There are many elements in the story we've seen in fantasy novels that came out before the story of the Book of Giants was readily available. Obviously, Lord of the Rings, things like that. I think that whether or not the story is true, I think that the story was passed along so much in our culture. I think it's become part of our cultural memory, where we may not actually remember the story itself, but the idea of alien invaders or supernatural beings trying to take over the planet, the idea of getting the entire planet on one battlefield to fight said invaders, the idea of divine intervention in a battlefield working side by side with the good aliens versus the bad aliens. You'll see that stuff across sci-fi, you'll see that stuff across fantasy literature, and I think it resonates to us like Lord of the Rings is because it's part of our cultural memory. For thousands of years, people believed this story was true, And then you can now read a story in the 1940s about a group of normal, quote-unquote, normal people siding with a good angel, Gandalf, versus an evil angel. You have Sauron, who's corrupting the world and everything like that. I don't think that he was reading the Book of Giants. And even if he did read the Book of Giants to write that, we didn't. I think our cultural knowledge of that story embedded into us made us more excited to hear that story. It was reminding us of those old days. I personally would like to believe the Book of Giants is real. Because it's awesome. I mean, that story is great. I love that story. I really would like it to be awesome. But, I mean, obviously the logical side of me is it's a interesting parable to explain a horrible natural disaster. But still. Wouldn't it be, wouldn't it be great if you knew for a fact that there was a time on this planet where we all united to fight back monsters 
and reclaim the world for ourselves. This story made me so excited. This story, this story got me so excited. I thought this story is like an action movie. And what does an action movie need? What does every action movie need? It needs a song during the credits that recap the events of the story. Yo, my name is Enoch, and I'm from another epoch. I once went to space, and I parted with the Ewoks. But long ago, the watches came inside. Some bitches had a bunch of giant babies turning women to witches, putting men up in stitches, warfare everywhere. They started eating flesh, so I got out of there. God sent a dream so they could come to me, and I could perceive what it all means. They got 200 trees, we got poisonous seeds, and soon you're gonna be six feet deep. It's war now. Get to your battle stations, no items, box only, final destination. But we don't fight fair when we come to fight. We come and loaded for bear. We got angels in the air, break bones and tear. Got the giant babies running in fear. Get that weak sauce out of here. We bring in 400k, we shooting fire and flame. Boy, you gotta know that we'll win in that day. Up, up and away, I went to heaven and stayed. And I'm a pimp up there, cause I ain't never been slayed. My name is Enoch. And I'm from another epoch I once went to space and I parted with the Ewoks I got one last thing to say I'm so OG, you'll find my rhymes in a cave <clears throat> Dead Rabbit Radio is your daily paranormal conspiracy and true crime podcast You don't have to listen to it every day But I'm glad you listened to it today Have a great one guys <laughs>